Hey fam, welcome back to the channel. I too have been inspired by these recent Fear Street films, so I would like to go over a collection of stories that I really loved as a kid that was one of my, the first uh, short horror collections I ever owned, I ever read, and that is Tales for the Midnight Hour. And in planning for this, I learned that there's more tales and even more tales. So I'm really freaking excited right now. I got some shit to buy. All right. So what I would like to do is go over with you the first two stories, though, because then you can get your own copy and read the rest of the book. OK, <laughs> these first couple of stories are just a couple of pages each. So let's go over them, shall we? OK, these two stories are to this day some of my all-time favorite shorts ever. Like creepypastas, a little flash fiction and shit. They're kind of flashy, aren't they? They're really freaking short. That's why I'm willing to do this. Oh, that was like my first flash fiction. To this day, they stick with me. And I always like, when I think of short horror tales, I always remember just the way I felt as a kid reading these stories just, it, they terrified me, so they, like, absolutely terrified me. So we're going to start off with the very first story, which is called The Furry Collar. Susan was my best friend, but I try to never think about her. It's only on certain nights, when I'm all alone in my room, that I remember. It was during Christmas vacation last year, when Susan asked me to stay at her house overnight. She lived in a big gloomy house set way back from the road and she didn't want to be there alone at night. Her parents had gone to visit some friends and wouldn't be back until the next afternoon. And Susan said we could have a really good time without her parents around. And we did. At about 12 o'clock, we decided to get dressed for bed. Susan had gotten this velvet night robe for Christmas that had a thick furry collar and it was blood red velvet and she looked like someone from a Dracula movie in it. We had been watching television in the living room, but then we turned it off. We hadn't noticed it before, but now the downstairs seemed too big and almost sinister. We started to go upstairs and then all of a sudden we both ran up the steps to Susan's room as if something was coming up from behind us. After we closed the door, we laughed at ourselves, but neither one of us wanted to leave the room again. We sat down, started to talk. That's when we first heard the noise. It sounded like somebody sharpening a knife on an old emery stone. We stopped talking and looked at each other, feeling really scared inside. There was just a thick silence in the room. Suddenly, Susan started to laugh. She said she had heard a sound like that in the house before. She said it was probably the shutters or something. That made me feel better, and we started to talk again. Then we heard it again. Screech, screech. The sound made my teeth vibrate as if somebody's fingernails were scratching on a chalkboard. But this sound was much worse. It shrieked up from the dark, lonely rooms below us. Screech. Susan got a wild look in her eyes as though something horrible had come into her head. Before I could catch her, she ran out of the room, slamming the door shut and flicking off the light switch. I heard her footsteps as she ran down the first flight of stairs and then stopped. I sat in the dark, sick with fright. I called out Susan's name, but my voice was answered by hushed silence. I didn't want to stay in the dark room alone, but even more, I didn't want to go out into that other darkness. Screech. I heard it again, a disgusting sound. Then I heard Susan's footsteps moving down the next and final flight of stairs. She went more slowly, as if she didn't really want to. I heard her reach the bottom. I waited in the room, wondering what Susan was doing. 
I told myself she must be all right. See, the noise had stopped right after I heard her reach the bottom of the stairs. It didn't come after that. Susan had probably just fixed the shutter. Maybe she had known for sure about that the whole time. She had just acted strangely to scare me. Thanks. Maybe she was sitting on the steps now laughing at me. I got up, started toward the door to turn the light on, but a feeling of fear swept over me that held me back like a hand against my throat. I decided I would wait where I was for Susan to return. I would wait there until her parents returned if necessary. Nothing could make me leave my darkness for that darker unknown outside the room. Time passed. My ears strained for a sound and my nerves tingled at imagined shadows. Then I heard a slow shuffling noise on the bottom step. Was it Susan? Must, it, I mean, it had to be. Yet the footsteps seemed too heavy too deliberate. My heart began to pound, and for a moment, I lost control of my mind. It flew to the most horrible corners of my imagination, and I shook with terror. And then suddenly, I knew what I would do. Susan's new night robe with the furry collar. I would wait for the door to open, and then I would reach out and touch the person's neck. If I felt the furry collar, I would know it was Susan, and I would get her back for scaring me like this. If I didn't feel the furry collar, well, then there was nothing I could do. <laughs> the shuffling footsteps had reached the second flight of stairs. I forced my own feet to take the steps to get near the door of the room. I felt the skin crawl on my back as the footsteps reached the top step and moved down the hallway. I braced myself. The door creaked slightly as it swung open. I reached my arms out and hoped. My fingers closed around the thick fur of Susan's collar. My body drained with relief. I moved my hands up to touch Susan's face. I was so happy. I no longer wanted to scare her. But as my fingers moved up from the furry collar, there was nothing. Only the bloody stump where Susan's head had been. Story two is called The Black Velvet Ribbon. There was one room in the house that the old man always kept locked. Things had not changed in that room for years. A soft layer of dust had settled on the furniture and on the thing that lay on the floor beside the bed. The old man had been a bachelor most of his life. When he was 40 years old, he had met her the girl with the black velvet ribbon. She was beautiful in a strange, mysterious way. Her hair and her deep, bottomless eyes were as black as the velvet ribbon around her neck. He planned to marry her before the next full moon rose in the autumn sky. On their wedding day, he watched her walk toward him up the long aisle. She was dressed in a white gown, a white veil, and carried a bouquet of white flowers. Even her face was ivory white, but below it, around the ivory neck, was the black velvet ribbon. He remembered staring at that ribbon as the strains of the wedding march brought his bride nearer to him. He remembered the curious and shocked looks on the faces of the wedding guests, but then his eyes met hers and he was drowning in their bottomless darkness. He didn't think of the velvet ribbon during the rest of his wedding day. It was a joyous time, and if people thought his wife a bit strange, he kept it to themselves. That night, when they were alone, he saw that the ribbon was still there, still circling her lovely neck. Don't you ever take that ribbon from around your neck, he asked, hoping his question was a needless one. You'll be sorry if I do, his wife answered, so I won't. Her answer disturbed him, but he did not question her further. There was plenty of time for her to change her ways. <laughs> I always forget about that line. Anyway, their life together fell into a pleasant pattern. They were happy, as most newly married couples are. He found her to be a perfect wife. Well, nearly perfect. 
Although she had a great number of dresses and wore a different one every day, she never changed the black velvet ribbon. This ribbon began to be the test of their marriage. When he looked at her, his eyes would inevitably fall to her neck. When he kissed her, he could feel the ribbon tightening around his own throat. Won't you please take that ribbon from around your neck? He asked her time and time again. You'll be sorry if I do, so I won't. She was always her answer. At first it teased him. Then it began to grate on his nerves. Now it was beginning to infuriate him. You'll be sorry if I do. You'll be sorry if I do. One day he tried to pull the ribbon off after she had repeated her answer like a mechanical doll. But it wouldn't come loose from her neck. He realized then for the first time that the ribbon had no beginning and no end. It circled her neck like a band of steel. He had drawn back from her in disgust that day. Things weren't the same with them after that. At the breakfast table, the black ribbon seemed to mock him as he drank his suddenly bitter coffee. In the afternoon, outside, the ribbon made a funeral out of the sunlight, but it was at night that the ribbon bothered him most. He knew he could live with it no longer. Either take that ribbon off or I will, he said on a night to his wife of only four weeks. You'll be sorry if I do, so I won't. She smiled at him and then fell off to sleep. But he did not sleep. He lay there, staring at the hated ribbon. He had meant what he said. If she would not take off the ribbon, he would. As she lay sleeping and unsuspecting, he crept out of bed and over to her sewing box. He had seen a small, sharp scissors. She kept there. It was thin enough, he knew, to slip between the velvet ribbon and her soft neck. Gripping the scissors in his trembling hands, he walked softly back to the bed. He came up to where she lay and stood over her. Her head was thrown back on the pillow and her throat with the black velvet ribbon around it rose ever so slightly with her breathing. He bent down, and with one swift movement, he forced the thin blade of the scissors under the ribbon, and then with a quick triumphant snip, he severed the ribbon that had come between them. Then the black velvet ribbon fell away from his wife's neck. Her head rolled off the bed and onto the floor she was muttering, you'll be sorry, you'll be sorry. See what I mean, fam? Oh, I was cool. Get this shit at the fucking book fair. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me in this. I can't wait to get the others and to see what those tales are like. If they can even come close to this collection that I've loved since my childhood. Do you have any stories from your childhood that were part of your introduction to horror besides Stephen King and shit like that? <laughs> Do you have a favorite Fear Street book? I don't want to talk about the Fear Street movies, although I will say that the third one, the first two, but that third one, that was definitely my favorite. And apparently the only way we know that a chick is a rebel is if we hear Cherry Bomb. Anyway, until next time and beyond, please take care. Now we'll try as well. <laughs>